welcome today to the International Baptist Church of Budapest. Some people are able to visit us for one Sunday. Some people are here for one semester. Other people spend a season of their life. So whatever category you might fall in today, we welcome you openly and warmly to the International Baptist Church of Budapest. The big announcement for those who are meeting in person, we received news that we will not be able to meet in person and the school for the month of October. We are actively finding other locations that we can continue our in-person worship services, and we will give you those updates as quickly as we can. Please go to our website, www.ibcbudapest.org, for updated information. Now, on an ongoing basis, there are small groups of people who meet for prayer on Tuesday night. There's a small group of people that meet for prayer on Friday at noon. There is also a ladies Bible study that meets in person. And then there are also other meetings that take place online. For instance, there is a group of uh, business professionals who meet online. So again, please contact the website for the updated information. As we continue our worship today, let's consider the words from Micah. Micah chapter 6. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. May we, in fact, follow these commandments even now as we continue in our time of worship. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is great. Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. Upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful O Savior of sinners, 
Thy name is excellent, thy glory high, thy compassions unfailing, thy condescension wonderful, thy mercy tender. I bless thee for the discoveries, invitations, promises of the gospel, for in them is pardon for rebels, liberty for captives, health for the sick, salvation for the lost. I come to thee in thy beloved name of Jesus. Re-impress thy image upon my soul. Raise me above the smiles and frowns of the world, regarding it as a light thing to be judged by men. Make thy praises be my only aim, thy word my one rule. Make me to abhor that which grieves thy Holy Spirit to suspect consolations of a worldly nature, to shun a careless way of life, to reprove evil, to instruct with meekness those who oppose me, to be gentle and patient towards all men, to be not only a professor, but an example of the gospel, displaying in every relation, office, and condition its excellency, loveliness, and advantages. How little have I illustrated my principles and improved my privileges. How seldom I served my generation. How often have I injured and not recommended my Redeemer. How few are those blessed through me. In many things I have offended in all come short of thy glory. Pardon my iniquity, for it is great. Lead me to be a true disciple of yours. Help me to be a doer, not merely a hearer of your word. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
Good morning. This is a reminder that God is at work in our hearts and in our lives and in our church. We have seen him supply our needs and we are trusting him for the future. I would encourage each of you to prayerfully consider what God would have you to do in terms of giving financially to the church. May God bless you and each of us as we are obedient to him. In the pages of world history, we can read about someone called Alexander the Great, a military leader who conquered vast areas of land. Or we can also hear about someone, learn about someone called Ivan the Terrible. The very nature of his name gives an indication of his personality. I'm living now in a country of Hungary and is well known for Attila the Hun, referring to a tribe of people. In the pages of our Bible, we can hear about a man called John the Baptist. But before there were modern day denominations, before there were Lutherans or Methodists or Catholics or Protestants, John the Baptist, that referred not to a denomination, but it refers to what he did, an act that he performed. Now, most religions involve a holy man doing holy things in a holy place to appease the wrath of an angry God. And worship becomes reduced to a set of rituals. They're even very similar to like magical incantations. If we just say the right words in the right way, then everything will be okay. We can appease this angry God. Now, in contrast to world religions and in contrast to doing rituals, the Bible tells us that there is a personal God who created us in his image so that we could enter into a personal relationship with him. And rituals are no substitute for vibrant relationships. However, it's often easier for us to perform an external ritual than it is to work on the internal nature of our heart. Now, Paul, in writing to the Ephesians in chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, he gives us insights, though, that we cannot work for our salvation. We cannot earn our salvation. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, the Bible is very clear. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So instead of following the rituals of the world, we are to pursue a vibrant relationship with Christ that's based upon his words and teachings. And as we've been looking at Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20, as we've been going verse by verse and phrase by phrase, we've been thinking about what does it mean to truly follow Jesus Christ to be a missional people. Let's read again today, Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Today, as we're looking at verse 19, as we're looking at these phrases, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Today, we come to that phrase, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, that is not some kind of magical ritual. 
The original Greek meaning of baptism was very clear to the very first people who were, who were Christians, people who understood the Greek language. A better translation would be, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, immersing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The original Greek word that we have translated here as baptizing is to immerse in water. And for the original Christians, the steps were very clear that Jesus was explaining. A person first accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They repented of their sins. They asked Jesus to come into their life. They began this relationship of following Jesus. And as an act of obedience, they were immersed in water. It symbolized his death on the cross, his burial into the tomb, but then his resurrection from the dead and into the family of God, into the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. By doing this action, by being baptized, they were declaring that they had already placed their faith in Jesus Christ. It, it wasn't just a mindless ritual. Now, moving forward several hundred years, strangely and sadly enough, the clear teachings of the early church, they became distorted. And baptism was turned into a form of a ritual. If you performed the right then regardless of what you understood or how you acted, you were called a Christian. And this distortion led to the word baptizing being translated, being transliterated instead of translated. You see, as the church developed and as different practices took place, when it came to the modern translation of our Bible, sprinkling was taking place and the translators were under pressure from the rulers of the day because the rulers of the day had come to a point strangely enough that instead of following the teaching of being immersed in water they were doing some other form and so as we read this exact phrase here baptizing them, we, we have a, a distortion creeping in. Now, the challenge of being a missional church is to return to hearing and obeying the teachings of Christ in all aspects of our lives. So in the biblical understanding, being baptized was a symbol of someone's faith. It was not a sacrament that helped us achieve our salvation. It was not a ritual that helped us to earn more credit. It was not something that we did to appease an angry God. It's not a ritual that works us into the family of faith. Instead, it's a symbol of our obedience to follow Christ's commands. To be a disciple is different than being a consumer who comes merely to perform certain rituals and then go and spend the rest of the week the way they want. This is the problem with rituals. Instead of working on the deep inner nature of our hearts, if we simply perform this ritual, we can then go out and do whatever we want. If we simply pay this amount of money, then everything has been canceled. But that's not the teaching of scriptures. The teaching of scriptures is that by following Jesus Christ, by becoming his disciple, all aspects of our lives are transformed. Our work, our finances, our relationships with other people, our treatment of our bodies, our forms of recreation, all of these should be reflections of a relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. They're not magical acts that we perform. So if the Bible had been completely translated, this man called John the Baptist that we read about, 
it doesn't refer to a denomination. It doesn't refer to some kind of political division. It refers in the original context, the, the translation would be John the Immerser. As people put their faith in God, as people follow Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, the act of baptism was the act of immersion under water. Now, for us today, growing as a disciple, what does that mean for you and me today? <clears throat> Are you growing as a disciple today? Have you taken off, so to speak, the training wheels? You know, when we have a small child, often there's a, there's a small device that they can, they can set on that, on that little four-wheeled device and they can scoot around and it's so fun. And then as they get a little bit older, they move to something called a tricycle and they learn how to pedal. And then eventually they move to something called a bicycle on two wheels now. And, but often there are training wheels that are attached so that the, the child can, can have some extra help. But the day comes that the training wheels are taken away. And that child now has the strength of their arms, the strength of their legs, the ability to focus their body, to balance their body, to go forward. And symbolically, to become a disciple of Christ means that we have matured. We don't just perform a ritual. No, we follow him. We don't just hear the words of Jesus. We obey his teachings. And as we obey his teachings, as a symbol of our obedience, as a symbol of our faith in him, that is why a person is baptized or immersed under the water. Now, coming back again to that question, have you taken off the training wheels or are you still just being a, a big baby with a big head, so to speak, and a, and a big stomach? But unfortunately, symbolically, your legs and arms are still weak. Are you growing as a disciple? Find someone to help you grow as a disciple. Find someone that you can pray with that person together. Not talk about prayer, but pray together. Find someone that you can read the Bible together. Not talk about the Bible, but read God's Word. Find someone that can help you put the acts of faith into action, not merely listening to them. So on one hand, we need to find someone that will help us to be a better disciple. On the other hand, the Bible continues in this passage and tells us that we need to make disciples of other people. So who are you discipling? You know, there's a, there's a form of education that is, that is often referred to by, by these simple steps. You watch one, you do one, and then you teach one. Sometimes this is referred to as, as what medical students do. Now, it's not just one, but a medical student, before they become a surgeon, or as they are in the process of, being, of becoming a surgeon, they will watch a surgery being performed over and over and over again. But then the time comes that the instruments are given to the student and the student begins to perform a surgery and they do it again and again and again. But then to really complete the cycle, the student then goes on and now they begin to teach someone else how to do this surgical procedure. Who are we helping? As we ourselves grow and as we become disciples who follow Jesus more and more in our everyday lives, how are we passing that along? How are we discipling someone else? So this week, again, let's think about the words of Jesus. It's not about rituals. It's, it's not about performing some mad or saying some magical words in just the right way. No, as we go into all the areas of our lives, 
as we make disciples of all the people of the world, in this original context, the people understood that as an act of obedience, that people would be immersed in water into the family of God, into the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. But it continues that they would teach people to observe all that they have been commanded. Who is helping us to become a better disciple? And who are we helping to become a better disciple? That's at the core. Vibrant relationships, that is our desire, not merely performing rituals. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was
For our benediction today, let's listen to the words of James. James chapter 1 says this, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, and goes away, and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. This week, as we go, may we be doers of the word and not only hearers who deceive ourselves. May you go and be blessed. Amen. Thank you.